Good afternoon, everyone. So again, this will be your introductory video for uh, Astronomy 101 lecture online. What I will do right now is I will share my screen and I will go into the Canvas site for the course. As you can see there, <clears throat> you have the home page, my introduction here, and you have quite some summarized information from the syllabus in here. Uh, how much the lab is worth, which is 40%, the lecture is 60%. Uh, how much the quizzes and the tests are worth for the course and the online settings and the dynamic for online classes. So as you know, online is not really remote life. You are not expected to log in at certain time and uh, attend a lecture online. But uh, all the information is online. It's actually in the shell in Canvas. So you have uh, the syllabus, you have the important dates, and then you have the free mini courses. Astronomy 101 is divided into three courses. You have the or three mini courses. The first part, which includes the introduction, chapter one, up until chapter four, Earth, Moon, and Sky, where we talk about the moon, the solar eclipse, the lunar eclipses, the orbit of the Earth around the sun, the orbit of the moon around the Earth, and then a little bit about constellations, Right, it's a very uh, introductory chapter for astronomy, right, or an introductory section for astronomy, chapter one, two, three, and four. And then we'll head towards chapter two, uh, or mini course number two, right here. But before each mini course, there will be an exam. So those are your free tests for the semester. Test one, test two, and test three. As you can see, none of the tests are cumulative. That means that Whatever topic we cover before each test won't be on the next test. That doesn't mean that the information and the knowledge doesn't build from previous knowledge, right? So for example, when we start talking about telescopes, when we're talking about, when we start talking about the solar system itself, uh, we will need to know things about gravity, the orbits, uh, how to observe the sky, um, arc minutes, arc seconds, which are introduced in chapter one, okay? Now, of course, you can always click here and take a look at the information of chapter one, right? There are some websites, a few of these videos, one of them doesn't work, so we have to move it. But you're probably wondering where you can get information regarding the lecture or the lecture itself, right? The lecture slides that you will use for information uh, together with a video and practice questions. So you go into modules. If you go into modules, you will find the introduction, chapter one, and the practice questions, right? And that's how it's going to be for the rest of the course, okay? So as you can see, there are already some sample questions, some videos I require you guys to watch to complement what we learn, right? And there will be discussion boards in here. I will open one. Actually, there's one already open for chapter one. And the syllabus is here. And then obviously your assignments, which will be quizzes and your tests. All right. Um, a minimum of five to six quizzes. There could be one more. All right. All online. And free tests. Now. Let's start a little bit with an introduction and then there will be another video uh, going a little bit more in depth on the slides. That will be published or uploaded tomorrow, okay? But to start, what you should do is you should have your slides open in here, all right? Together with that, I think it's a good idea if you guys download Stellarium. You're probably gonna be using it if you're doing the lab, and I think you guys most will be doing the lab. The Stellarium is a software that we use to complement the course. It's the software that we use for the labs. And as you can see there, it's a software simulation. 
it allows you to observe the night sky as if you were actually in real life outside. Now, one of the constraints when we look at the night sky or even during the day, right? So let's actually go on the night is that not every object can be observed. You can look at some planets, Jupiter and Saturn, they're very bright in the sky, well, depending on the time of the year. And it's hard to pinpoint constellations, right? Uh, that's because of the atmosphere. You will learn in chapter five, how important it is to have telescopes out there, like the Hubble, and later on the James Webb Telescope. So if we remove the atmosphere, we can clearly see more objects in the night sky. So that's gonna let you observe with more um, clarity things in the night sky that are not very obvious, all right? In, many, in some cases, the planets like Saturn and Jupiter or constellations or some stars like, for example, here, uh, Vega, which is the brightest star, the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere. All right, so that's interesting. That's very cool, right? Um, make sure that if you are required to use this software for the lab, you actually spend some time playing with it and see what information you can get, all right? You can always ask me questions because I also teach the lab. Uh, and by the way, any sort of information or any sort of meeting will have to be by appointment and I will be using WebEx. So if we decide to have an appointment or if you want to have a discussion live, um, I can send you guys the link and then we can meet and we can discuss any questions you may have about a quiz or about a chapter in particular. All right. So just for you guys to know, I'm actually an astronomer and an astrophysicist, all right? This is not really the place where I work, but it's very similar. It's kind of what you will find in observatory, right? Nowadays, an observatory is managed using several computers or several screens, right? Because they can be automated. Uh, it's not like what Galileo did or Hubble, that they will be going to an observatory later at night. You can actually do it remotely, all right? But the idea is to filter, capture images, move that telescope according to what we can observe that given night, all right? Or what you're actually looking at. If you're looking, for example, at the center of the Milky Way, which was my uh, topic of research when I was an undergrad, um, you will have to know what is the best time of the year, and then in some cases book a telescope for a certain amount of time, all right? Um, there are several telescopes out there that we can actually use for deep observations besides the Hubble. You have the Keck telescopes in Hawaii. You have the telescopes in La Silla, right? You also have radio telescopes. We will learn what's the difference between an optical telescope and a radio telescope in the course, all right? But in general, right, it's very important to distinguish as well the difference between astronomy and astronautics, right? Astronautics is what you see there, right? is exploring space by sending uh, shuttles, uh, by, for example, sending the man to the moon and later on, hopefully soon to Mars. But exploring the space does is not limited to sending shuttles, like, you know, the Atlantis or like the Opportunity, the Vikings, right, the Huggins. No, we actually use telescopes because if you think about it, right, there's a huge range and space is huge. So we need to find a way to uh, avoid, maybe that's not, that's not the correct word, but remember how hard it is to travel to the moon and to Mars, right? It takes a long time because of the very large distances. So what we do in astronomy is we can explore very distant systems, solar systems, stars, the galaxies, by just staying at home, right? Sort of. Uh, by using very powerful telescopes. So we can map the sky with a lot of accuracy, okay? We will also learn in chapter five, how we actually map the universe 
not just in optical wavelengths, but in different wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum, which is basically light. Light comes in different flames, right? You can have optical, you can have infrared, microwave, radio. So that is something that we know and we can actually use to explore the universe, right? Um, actually, I went to the, uh, in Florida, you know, they have the shuttle, the shuttles, the Apollo, right? Uh, Cabo Cañaveral, right? And it was a very interesting trip. If you ever go to Florida, right, uh, in Orlando, actually, so besides going to Disney and Universal, you can always go there. Uh, it's a nice touristic place, um, not very expensive. And it's great for kids, for seniors as well, right? Even though I know there is a horrible annoying pandemic right now, but I'm pretty sure in a few months they will be ready to, or maybe they are already open actually, but you can still go maybe next summer, right? It's a very nice trip. Anyway, so as I was saying, right? Chapter one is an introduction. So we start introducing you guys to the understanding of the universe, how we actually use the laws of physics. So this is the thing. That's why there is a field called astrophysics because astronomy and physics, and obviously mathematics, they actually go together. Um, to understand astronomy, we need physics, we need physical laws, and we need mathematics. Now, that doesn't mean that the course will be heavy on the math. No, this is an introductory astronomy course. So we will be focusing on the facts. When we talk about gravity, we will discuss about the theory of gravity, how it works, why it's important, what it governs, why do we care, why do we use it, but that's it. We won't be doing calculations of gravitational pull or gravitational force. That's more the physics side or astrophysics side of the, of the course, which won't be part of this introductory astronomy course, right? But still, you have to understand, all right, that behind all these pictures, behind everything that you look in the night nice sky, there, are, there is physics and mathematics behind it, all right? When you look at light coming towards the atmosphere or through the atmosphere, when you look at planets revolving the sun or stars going around the center of galaxies, Everything has to do with some sort of physics, classical physics, and nowadays we know in some extreme situations we have to use spatial and general relativity, right? Um, all right, so to understand science, we need to understand the fact that we have a scientific method. So we have the laws of physics, but they are made by testable theories and models. For example, um, something that you should know about a scientific method is that, yes, it's based on observation, logic, and skepticism. Why is that? Because we cannot just accept anything that we read, anything that they tell us without being tested, right? Uh, a good example of what's happening right now with this uh, pandemic, right? Whatever you read in the news, you have to be very analytical, right? Because remember, a lot of that is misinformation. It can be information that is twisted, right? Because of the political environment. So what we have to do, what we do in science is we stay apart from all that. We have to stay away from all that and then make a model and have a theory based on the observations and the data that we have, right? And also the data has to be veridic, right? It cannot be just data that is made up. So all those can be obstacles, but they lead you to construct a proper theory. Now in science, we have a lot of theories. We have the theory of relativity slash gravity, we have the theory of light, we have the theory of evolution, but if you think about it, all of those are actually laws. They are accepted, we know, we can observe them happening in nature, right? Relativity, evolution itself have, has been tested a lot. And I will even add the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory is still called a theory because we never saw it happening, but there is abundant, overwhelming abundance of information and evidence that it really happened, right? Now, that's not topic of Astronomy 101, but in Astronomy 102, we go into the redshift of galaxies, we go into the cosmic microwave background radiation. So that's how we know that it happened, because we can measure the remnants of that big, quote, explosion, right? Um, in any case, 
Uh, remember that the scientific method also includes, uh, after observation, you have the hypothesis, where you collect your ideas based on your observations to explain a phenomenon. And then you can elaborate a theory after you test your uh, hypothesis, right? You do what we know as an experimentation. You can also have a model. It can be mathematical or di diagrammatic, right? So you have a diagrammatic representation, sorry, of the hypothesis. So a mathematical model can be, for example, Kepler laws, which we will study in uh, chapter three, when we talk about gravity. So Kepler laws were used to understand the idea behind the motion of the planets around the sun. He was basically the precursor for Newton's laws. Okay? Now, think about it, right? We call it Newton's laws, but there is a caveat though. They work in familiar environments. We can send shuttles to the moon by knowing, by using Newton's laws. That's perfect. But Newton's laws don't work when we approach a black hole. They don't work when we approach a neutron star or when we try to model the Big Bang. For that, we need a higher theory. So what's happening there? What happens is that 100, 200, 300 years ago, we didn't know better, right? We were just here on Earth, and we were just looking at horses running. Uh, later on, we will see probably, uh, I don't know, uh, apples falling from the trees. Uh, in the last century, we started seeing cars, uh, airplanes. So all of that can be explained with classical mechanics based on Newton's laws. Perfect. But once we go into higher speeds, higher densities, extreme environments in the universe, like neutron stars, supernovas, black holes, AGMs, the Big Bang Theory itself, or even the quantum reality, right? Newton's laws don't really work. So why are they still called laws? Because when Newton came up with this, uh, the scientific method, first of all, wasn't totally polished, Plus, we were in what we call the era of law. Another example would be the laws of the thermodynamics. They are called laws of thermodynamics. In the base principle, using the base principle, using the same principle, right? We could call relativity the laws of relativity, right? Uh, so far, it can explain everything that we can observe. GPSs, um, even the orbits of planets around the sun, the precession of the orbit of Mercury, the perihelion of Mercury preset, uh, changes due to the strong gravitational pull, right? Mars, Mercury is the closest planet to, uh, to the sun. So there is a variation there due to, and we can, and it can only be explained with relativity, not with Newton's laws, by the way. So there it is, right? Um, even though there is a difference between a law and a theory, um, some of the theories that we have nowadays can be called laws, especially if we use them uh, with the same ideas or principles that we had a few decades or centuries ago. But in general, the laws of physics are theories that, that accurately describe the workings of a physical reality. So basically the working of the universe, right? And there are many examples of those. Now, how come, uh, the astronomy 101 is basically uh, astronomy of a solar system. So we're gonna be focusing about exploration of other planets and how we understand the solar system and the nature of it. So first of all, we study the sun. And nice because in here we have these sunspots. We will learn about the different layers of the sun in this course, right? The chromosphere, we will learn about the photosphere, we will learn about the difference between the temperature on the surface of the sun and in the core of the sun and how the energy is released and it gets to us in form of heat, right? So we will study, study the sun, but we will also study the other planets in the solar system. We have the terrestrial planets and the Hovian planets. So what's the difference is basically their composition, right? Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars are made of rock, while you have Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune. They are the gas giants, and Uranus and Neptune are also called gas slash icy giants. So we will learn about those. We will learn the big difference between them and the planets like the Earth. Uh, we will talk about the asteroid belt in between uh, Jupiter and Mars, 
right? And then we'll also talk about the moons of each of those planets, at least in particular a few of the moons, like for example, Titan, Europa, Enceladus, etc., etc. Uh, all right. So to as I was saying, right, to understand uh, even the solar system, we need telescopes. They are our best tool to explore the space. And then you have a picture of the Hubble telescope, right? Is the most powerful telescope right now out there in space, all right? But at some point it will be uh, delegated, right? It's job to the James Webb telescope, which will be a much bigger telescope, right? With different uh, sensors, one of them an infrared camera, right? And it, won't, it will not orbit the Earth. It will actually be orbiting the sun, right? The idea with the James Webb telescope is to actually explore and go beyond the limits of the Hubble, right? So that's that. Now, remember that when we explore the planets, we can get clues of the formation of the solar system, right? You have the Hovian planets very far, and actually the distance between them are huge in comparison with the distance between the terrestrial planets. So why is that? What clue does that give us about the formation of the, of the solar system? Why are they made of gas and us, and we are made, and the Earth, for example, or Mars or Jupiter or, or Venus are made of rock? Right? Why is that? So that's some, some of the questions that we can answer by exploring not just the planets, but also the asteroids, the meteorites that are the ones that land on Earth. All right? So there is that. We will also learn about the sun and the fact that the stars have a life cycle. They are not ever living, right? The stars like the sun, they can live for billions of years, approximately 10 billion years. Right, but there are stars out there that are huge, very massive, way more massive than the, than the sun. Right, some of them are super giants, super red giants, blue giants, and in some of those, they can only live for a few hundred thousand years or barely a millions of years. Right, the more mass they have, the more fuel they consume, the more rapidly they will collapse. Right, again, that's more astronomy 102, but it's always good that so you guys know about these things. All right. Um, and then a very nice picture from the Hubble, right? When we study these pictures taken from those powerful telescopes, we see different colors. So something that we will learn as well is why there are different colors, right? What does this mean? It means, well, maybe not much about the temperature of the stars, but the fact that there are different types of stars, right? You have red giants, blue giants, you have main sequence stars, you have red dwarfs. So, um, then we can also study the nebulas and reflection nebulas, emission nebulas, sites where there is a star forming regions, right? Um, all right, so when we wanna understand a star, we need to understand this guy, right? Thermonuclear explosions, because that's what's happening billions or millions or billions of those per second in a star, right? Uh, basically what's going on in the core of the stars is what we know as nuclear fusion not fission, which is basically the, what you're seeing there. But similarly to that, we have two atoms, for example, of hydrogen coming together and producing a heavier atom of helium and then emitting radiation in what we know as the triple alpha process, right? So that's something that we'll actually, we will actually do a little bit in uh, when we study the sun, all right? That's there an emission nebula. We know that because of the purple reddish color there, that's a characteristic of a hydrogen alpha emission line. Okay, and uh, this is the Orion Nebula actually, right, taken by, uh, by NASA there, with the Hubble telescope. The characteristics of this nebula is that embedded, we cannot see them because of the density of the cloud itself and the temperature of it, but embedded in that cloud, they can be Lots of stars, they can be a star cluster being formed right now. All right, so that's very cool, right? Uh, picture wise, it looks very nice, but I want you guys to learn what does that mean? What's emission, what's reflection, right? What are the conditions for stars to form, right? Um, and then you have there what a more chaotic environment as the Crab Nebula, a supernova remnant uh, that was detected approximately in 1987, it was the first supernova ever observed. Now, something that you need to know, that thing happened probably, well, according to the information we have millions of years ago, 
how come we were able to wash it just on 1987? Because of the speed of light. That's also very important. The speed of light is not infinite. It actually travels at a limit, right? At a limit rate in time and space, okay? And that's important, time and space. We don't live in a three-dimensional or two-dimensional universe, right? We have the plane, that's 2D, in 3D, we have, right? Like a room, but we actually live in a 4D universe because we have to include time, okay? So that's very important. Uh, all right, then we have what galaxies are, which are very big, large groups of stars, billions of stars per galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies at least that we know of. So imagine how many stars there are out there, and remember, there could be a little, very little percentage of a very large number that are stars like the sun, and there can be also a very small percentage of those stars that can have solar system like ours. So that always brings a question if there could be life out there besides us, right? Uh, or any other type of organic life. Um, all right, so I think if we have to leave it there for now, what I will do on the next video is explain to you guys how we measure things in the night sky. Uh, I want you guys to read this, which are basically uh, tools that you will use also in Stellarium. What you will learn is that when we look at distances between objects in the night sky, let me show you just with these two. The distance is even in degrees, minutes, and seconds. How come? Right? There are two reasons. First of all, because we are looking at these objects that are very, very, very far. All right? And to accurately get the distance in light years, it will be very hard. But we can actually use what we know as the small angle approximation. All right? We use angles to denote positions and apparent sizes of objects in the sky. Right? So there it is, right? We can have the angular distance between the stars in a little deeper, and the same with the sun and clocks. And then by knowing those angular distances, we can tell because, it, remember, right? A half a circle is 180 degrees. So we can actually map positions in the sky. That's what we do with the celestial sphere, which I will try to show you. I'm here in the observatory, so I can try to show you that uh, in one of the recordings, that it's very neat. You have the Earth at the center, and then you have the constellations, right? 88 constellations, by the way. Um, that we can observe from the local group of galaxies. And the nice thing is that we can use them to locate different objects in the night sky, all right, or for navigation, right? Anyway, um, let's leave it there. I will give you guys another video. I know this was a bit long for an introduction, but uh, I hope that if you have any questions, you can use a discussion board and the slides plus the practice questions are enough information for your first quiz, which will be, uh, let's see here, which is due on September 21st. Well, I have to extend that because we're, we're starting on the 16th, right? So uh, we will change that as well. Okay. Have a nice rest of your day.